Imagine journeying to a far-flung patch of the Western Australian outback, about 30 kilometers from the nearest town. In this quiet red dirt landscape lies Mount Weld, an unassuming hill concealing one of the richest caches of rare earth elements on the planet. Rare earths might not sound familiar, but they're the hidden heroes inside your smartphone, electric car and wind turbine. Mount Weld's story spans two billion years of geologic drama and a modern mining operation that has turned this ancient deposit into a strategic powerhouse. Let's explore how a prehistoric volcanic eruption, some fortuitous chemistry, and a lot of Aussie ingenuity combine to make Mount Weld a marvel of the rare earth world. Mount Weld's origins read like a deep time adventure. Over two billion years ago in the Proterozoic Eon, a volcano punched through what is now Western Australia's Yilgung Craton and formed a carbonatite, essentially a magma pipe rich in carbonates and exotic minerals. You can think of carbonatite magmas as a sort of mineral rich soup. As it cooled and solidified into a 3 to 4 km wide cylindrical plug beneath the surface, it was loaded with rare metals like neodymium, praseodymium, cerium and others that we prize today. For millions of years this treasure brew lay hidden deep underground. Fast forward through the ages and nature's forces took over. The region went through intense weathering, basically eons of rain and groundwater percolating down dissolving some minerals and concentrating others. Geologists call Mount Weld's deposit a carbonatite derived laterite, which is a fancy way of saying that the top of the ancient volcanic plug got rusted and leached into a super rich soil. Picture making a reduction source in cooking. As less stable ingredients like calcium and magnesium carbonates got washed out by water, the rare earth elements were left behind like a thick, flavorful syrup. The rare earths recombined into new secondary minerals. These minerals are finally dispersed in the iron rich soil or regolith capping the deposit. The result was a supergene enriched rare earth zone right near the surface, meaning incredibly high concentrations of rare earth oxides in the top 50 to 60 meters of the ground. One remarkable quirk is how intact Mount Weld's rich cap remained. While other ancient carbonatite deposits in the region got scaled away by time, one nearby at Ponton was stripped by ancient glaciers, Mount Weld's rare earth laden blanket stayed put, protected by a gentle geologic history. This left an almost pure bowl of rare earth soup just below ground level. Geologists estimate that about 1.8 kilometers of the old volcano eroded away, leaving a residual high grade ore lens at the top. The richest part, known as the Central Lanthanide Deposit or CLD, sits right at the center of the carbonatite pipe and boasts some of the highest rare earth grades ever found. In fact, Mount Weld is often cited as one of the world's highest grade rare earth mines, with ore that can average around 6-8% TREO, total rare earth oxide, which is several times richer than many other deposits around the globe. For context, an ore body with even 3% TREO is considered good. Mount Weld's core zones are truly exceptional. Despite all that hidden wealth, Mount Weld didn't draw attention until the 20th century. It doesn't have flashy outcrops of minerals at the surface, so discovery came by airplane. A geophysical survey in 1966 spotted a strange magnetic and gravity anomaly under otherwise ordinary alluvial flats. Drillers soon confirmed a carbonatite buried below, and by the 1980s explorers realized that the weathered cap contained extraordinarily high rare earth grades. The main rare earth zone, the CLD, was formally identified around 1988. Various companies poked at it over the years, but it wasn't until the Linus Corporation, today Linus Rare Earths, acquired full control in 2002 that things kicked into high gear. Mining at Mount Weld began in earnest in 2007 with a small scale start and ramped up around 2011 once financing and processing facilities were lined up. The operation is an open pit mine, more akin to a shallow quarry than a giant pit. In fact, because the ore is so high grade and so near the surface, the pit doesn't have to be enormous or deep. Linus proudly notes that Mount Weld's footprint is relatively small and shallow compared to many mines, which also makes it easier to manage and rehabilitate. Imagine a scooper taking the top layer off a cake. That's essentially what the mine does, peeling off soil and rock to get to the frosting rich in rare earths. And after two decades of mining, there's still plenty left. As of 2024, the proven and probable ore reserves have grown to 32 million tonnes at about 6.4% TREO, roughly 2 million tonnes of rare earth oxides contained in the ground. That reserve supports decades of production ahead. So how do they actually extract and process these special metals? The mining process at Mount Weld starts with traditional open pit methods. Drill, blast in the harder zones and scoop up the ore. The on-site concentration plant then takes over, 
Big haul trucks deliver the ore to the plant where it goes through crushing and grinding circuits to reduce the rock to a fine powder. Next comes a bit of mineral magic, flotation. In flotation tanks, chemicals and bubbles are used to make the rare earth bearing minerals, like monazite, float and separate from the non-valuable minerals. This upgrades the material into a richer form. The concentrated slurry is then filtered to remove water, producing a mixed rare earth concentrate, a brownish powder that contains all the rare earths mixed together. At this stage, Mount Weld's output is still not the shiny metal or oxide that end users need, so further refining is required. In the early years, Linus would pack this concentrate into half-height shipping containers called rotainers and send it 2,500 miles by sea to Malaysia. There, at the Linus Advanced Materials Plant, or LAMP, in Kuantan, the concentrate undergoes complex chemical processing, cracking, leaching, solvent extraction and purification steps that isolate individual rare earth oxides like neodymium and praseodymium. By 2013, LAMP was fully operational and could handle about 22,000 tonnes of REO output per year, nearly doubling Linus's capacity once it came online. This international supply chain turned Mount Weld's raw dirt into high purity rare earth products for global markets, but it also meant dealing with radioactive residues, from trace thorium in the ore in Malaysia, which spurred some controversy and calls to bring more processing back on shore. In recent years, Linus has done exactly that by investing in a new processing facility in Kalgoorlie in Western Australia, much closer to the mine. As of late 2024, the Kalgoorlie Rare Earths Processing Facility has begun cracking and leaching Mount Weld's concentrate to produce an intermediate mixed rare earth carbonate, MREC. This step neutralizes most of the radioactive elements and produces a cleaner product that is then shipped to Malaysia or potentially other future separation plants for final refining. The move not only addresses environmental concerns but also adds value within Australia. It's a complex dance, but it's one that has made Linus the only significant producer of separated rare earth materials outside China. Mount Weld's mine produces a remarkable quantity of rare earth material each year. In 2019, for example, the site hit a record output, about 19,737 tonnes of rare earth oxides in one year, of which roughly 5,900 tonnes were the in-demand NDPR oxides used for high power magnets. That's nearly 20 million kilograms of rare earth compounds, an impressive haul for a single mine in a desert. If you filled shipping containers with that much material, you'd have a long convoy heading to the port. All those tons of rare earths translate into some serious money. Rare earth elements are valuable. Neodymium praseodymium oxide, for example, was selling for around 50 to 55 US dollars per kilogram in mid-2025. So how does Mount Weld's output stack up financially? In recent years, Linus Rare Earths, the owner-operator of Mount Weld, has been pulling in on the order of 500 million in revenue per year from its rare earth products. In the fiscal year 2025 results, Linus reported about 556.5 million Australian dollars in revenue, around 360 million US dollars. The year before was a bit lower at 463 million Australian dollars, reflecting some market price swings and a deliberate shift to produce fewer low value elements. But the big picture is that Mount Weld has evolved into a hundreds of millions per year operation, a far cry from when it was a fledgling project in the 2000s. Looking ahead, the projected lifetime earnings from Mount Weld are truly massive, with an expanded mine life of 20 plus years at higher production rates, and possibly 35 plus years at current rates, Mount Weld is expected to keep producing well into the 2040s or 2050s. If rare earth prices hold up, this one mine could generate tens of billions of Australian dollars in revenue over its lifespan. Another unique aspect is Australia's position versus China. Rare earths have been historically dominated by China, which produces over 80% of global supply. Mount Weld, however, turned Australia into a non-Chinese source of these critical elements. In fact, Linus, fed by Mount Weld, remains the only significant rare earths producer outside China as of the mid-2020s. This gives Mount Weld outsized strategic importance. Governments around the world, from the US to Japan and across Europe, have a keen interest in Linus's success because it provides a more secure and diversified supply of rare earths for high-tech industries. It's not an exaggeration to say Mount Weld is a linchpin of Western rare earth supply chains, making it a bit of a geopolitical asset as well as an economic one. Few places on earth combine such rich geology with favourable mining conditions in a safe jurisdiction as Mount Weld does. As a result, this once little known Australian hill has become famous among engineers and policymakers alike. It stands shoulder to shoulder with the world's top rare earth sites and, in certain respects, outshines them. Mount Weld is the kind of mine you might compare to a fine diamond. 
Not the biggest rock in the room, but pound for pound one of the most valuable. And like a diamond, it was formed by unusual forces, discovered with a bit of luck, and ultimately brought to life to shine on the global stage, powering technologies that define our modern life. Mount Weld's story from ancient volcano to high-tech enabler shows how something buried for billions of years in the Australian outback can suddenly become critical to the future of technology around the world. I hope you found this as interesting as I did. And as always, thanks for watching. I like rocks. Do you like rocks? If so, I've got some absolute beauties to share with you from my new mine. Quartz crystals in shades of white, red and black bristling with abundant golden pyrite that sparkles like treasure. Some of the crystals have even grown so sharply they look like jagged teeth frozen in stone. Like, look at this little fella. It honestly looks like a jaw full of quartz teeth. Don't worry though, it doesn't bite, usually. And this one looks like a dinosaur skull with quartz crystals popping out on the top of it. These aren't random rocks, they're hand selected because of their unique features. They come from the heart of the Victorian goldfields from an area that was once mined for gold, silver and antimony. Assays reveal minerals like arsenopyrite, stibnite and pyrite, with refractory gold locked inside the sulphides. For the very first time you can own a piece of the Ausgeology collection, and with it a tangible fragment of the Victorian goldfields themselves. Each specimen comes with its own geology card, so you can hold not just a rock, but a piece of Earth's history in your hands. These are one of a kind treasures and once they're gone, they'll never come again. If you'd like to hold a specimen born in fire, locked in time and revealed only now, check out the link in the description, or visit the Ausgeology website. Before I end this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.